I've recorded this twice now. It's 11.30 at night. Uh, so, uh, what harm is coffee gonna do? Happy 2024, everyone. I am finally back from Texas visiting family and back home. No more planes to catch, no more holidays to make plans for. I can finally just make some nice videos and just ramble as I want to about Legions Imperialis and probably some more 40k stuff more regularly because I don't have to be on a plane for a while if there's anything I can do about it. I hate flying. Let's just hope we're here for a while. I hope everyone had a wonderful holiday season. I broke my phone, so I wasn't able to record anything until now, but was able to still see all your encouraging messages and everyone subscribing, and it was really cool to see everyone kind of coming in and seeing, especially that last Imperial Fist video I do, and see how things are growing at a surprisingly quick rate. So I'm happy to be back at it, happy to give y'all something, and I have a special announcement for everybody at the end of this video. So after I give the list and my thoughts, stick around, but let's go ahead and jump in, finally, to the Solar Auxilia list I have prepared for y'all that I think you're gonna find interesting. Now, before we jump into Solar Auxilia, hold on, more coffee. Again, it is very late and I have work in the morning. <laughs> Unwise decisions. Before we jump into Solar Auxilia, there's a few things we need to consider and that is where they are right now and their strengths and weaknesses. As I've seen a lot of people talk about, it seems anytime you're looking at a YouTube video, of which there's not a ton right now covering battles, let's get that out of the way. But when you watch one, it, Exilia seems to lose quite a bit. Now, caveats, these are at very low point values, often not even at 1500 points, but even at higher point values, in theory, Auxilia at release does seem less likely to win than Astartes. It's actually quite simple as to why, and it's one main reason. There's a lot of small reasons, but there's one main reason, and that is that it's an objective-based game which requires mobility. And in that sense, Astartes takes it every time. Let's look at why. Their infantry is more durable, not much more durable, mind you. It's, it's, you know, it's Legion Superialis, everything has a terrible save unless it's armor, but they are more durable unless they're in cover. They have more mobility inherently. They have jump troops, they have deep striking troops inherently, they have three different forms, that's the number three, of transports at release in the form of the Rhino, the Storm Eagle, and the Thunderhawk. And as was just announced, there are drop pods coming in the next release, along with a full suite of Outriders with bikes, land speeders, and such. They already are quite quick, and they're not limited by the aura of their command structure to do double or triple moves in the case of their infantry. So with a Jump Marine by themselves, they can order and go 21 inches. A solar auxilia unit, first off, doesn't have anything that quick or with the ability to fly uh, in terms of infantry, but also in order to consistently move that fast has to stay within a command aura. Otherwise, it's not allowed to use that order. So we have that. We have the transport issue. And while there are some more coming, at release, the only transport the Auxilla have are the flyers, which only transport two bases each. They're like a flying rhino, essentially. And they aren't an assault vehicle. And because they're a flyer, they have to start off the field. So they're reactive. But again, they're reactive on something whose main infantry shooting-wise isn't that great. So it's by itself, not a very good delivery method for a payload because you don't really have great shooting infantry and your melee infantry can't charge out of it because you don't have an assault vehicle. So it's not great and it's monetarily quite expensive to get a hold of those in bulk, especially for how much each model transports. So they have a disadvantage there, and like I said, there is another one coming, but I don't see that being terribly anything special. Maybe it's a low-capacity assault vehicle because it's like a tread tank, but we'll see. I don't know the lore behind that tank at the moment, so I can only sort of guess at it. But even though they're getting that one, the Marines having 
all of that capacity, even just with their infantry, even without the transports, is great. And then you throw in the fact that you have entire chapters that add to this. We've talked about Alpha Legion, similar things with Raven Guard, and we have Dark Angels that all have these various abilities that allow for forward deployment and infiltration and things like this that allow you to really take advantage of spacing on the battlefield in a way that a sole solar auxiliary list just cannot do, at least not right now. There are so many limitations on what you can do if you're going pure solar auxilia that you really have to lean further into the strengths of the list or really aim to bond the shit out of whatever the strengths your opponent has. So overall, auxilia, soul auxilia, is in a rougher spot when it comes to actually winning the game and scoring depending on how you're playing and depending on how good of a player you are. It's worth noting that this can obviously be fixed with allies. And I think there's actually a really good for competitive play uh, argument for Auxilio just really should be taking Marine allies, especially once these drop pods come out. You should be having just a small contingent of allies, maybe a couple hundred points of just drop pod Marines, you know? Uh, just replay the game Space Marine and have Captain Titus and Sergeant Sedonis drop down and save the day. Holy shit, I can't wait for Space Marine 2 to come out. I, I'm so sad they delayed it, but I understand. Just please be as good as I hope you're going to be. However, with my videos and what y'all seem to request, we tend to lean into more isolated lists or more all-encompassing lists when it comes to a identity uh, in one of two ways. We either lean into a flavor, being like Alpha Legion, where we went all Alpha Legion with the exception of one Titan, or Imperial Fists, which was an all Imperial Fist list. Uh, the exception to that being if we find a gimmick that we really want to lean into and allies just really serve that gimmick well, such as in the Emperor's Children's list that very much still had an Emperor's Children identity. I don't want to be making lists that are just like hodgepodges of allies because identity is something really fun in wargaming, you know, having that theme, having that uh, persona about you in your army. So rather than just tell you, oh, you have to take Marines, I'm going to try to show you a main solar auxiliary list that doesn't take Marine allies, that shows a level of flexibility that is rather unique, I think, and still shows that despite these shortcomings, Auxilia has room to experiment and has room to be good if played and designed well. With that, let's go ahead and get started. And we have a list at 1,498 points. Just a reminder, in these early videos, I'm sticking to 1,500 points for now because as we're sort of experiencing the game in its early days, I wanna give people enough knowledge at an early level that they're able to build up confidently after experimenting to 3,000 points. As someone who teaches 40K a lot, that is really important. Don't just have someone dive into 2,000. That is the easiest way to get buyer's remorse. We start with a very simple Solar Auxilia sub cohort that is incredibly bare bones. We're actually taking the cheaper version of the uh, Legate Commander, or the 10 point version. The main difference between the Commander versions is one has a bigger aura. That's the really important thing. And in most lists, I would recommend taking the more expensive Commander. The reason being, and the reason being I would in higher lists take like a lot of them if you can, like multiple small formations, is in the rule for Solar Auxilia HQ, something a lot of you may not know, that ability is not formation specific, meaning any aura given by a commander is enough to allow a unit to receive orders other than the normal advance order, meaning they can still charge and double move and first fire and all these things. Having multiple of them allows you to make concentric circles of command that all of your army can benefit from, so you're less vulnerable if you stretch too far out or if one of your commanders just dies. The only exception is they can't affect broken formations. But for now, we're going with the cheaper one, and we're also going with a Veltar Storm section and two Laz Rifle Tercio squads, filling out our compulsory detachment as cheap as possible. And that is all we're doing with those units. We're not doing anything more with them. And they meet our purposes for now because we're actually taking a note from my Alpha Legion playbook here, and you'll see why in just a moment. We are then using four of the Arvis Lighter transports in two detachments of two. Now, you might think 
oh, okay, the Velatar Storm section is definitely going in one of those, and you would actually be wrong. See, the Velatar Storm section is your best defense against a backline unit coming and taking anything in your deployment zone. They are going to sit with your commander in the back and stay safe, and if anything gets near, they're able to charge and very easily handle themselves in combat, or if they get charged, are easily able to defend. You can easily tweak this list to fit more of them in, but essentially without a dedicated transport, they are going to be a heavy target unless you are running a very heavily saturated infantry list because people people know what these things do. They have the rend ability. They're very good in combat against Marines. It's kind of insane. So are Ogren. Ogren are better, but for now, this is what we have points-wise to fit in, and this is what we're going to be running, and you're going to be running them defensively at this point. Again, plenty of room for tweaking, but this is what we're doing. The Arvis Lighters are then staying off the table and transporting the Tercios, and the general idea here is we are going to adopt a strategy where we have a response team that is coming in and cleaning up the debris of what our main force is just decimating. We are meant to have a very hard hitting and somewhat less mobile main force that is making the most of a very cheap and mobile objective force afterwards in order to just take things while the enemy is still having to deal with armored threats. We round out this formation with a Marauder Colossus for three reasons. The first reason is uh, bombers are cool. You ever flown a flying fortress in a video game? I mean, it just the idea is fun as hell. The second reason is the Marauder Colossus is a low risk investment because the main reason you're taking it is for a one time use bomb that is quite good. And it isn't a very tough fighter by any means. It's one wound, it has a three up save. It's going to get shot down but it delivers its payload in its movement phase, and as long as it doesn't get overwatched down, you're gonna be able to drop that payload and make use of it in a very fun way because of the bombing run rule and an odd specification within it. See, when you do a bombing run, you pick a point during your movement, and essentially what you do is you pick a detachment that is three inches away from you, or within three inches, and you drop your bombs. You roll to hit, you know, you do the saves as normal. The odd thing about it, bombing run specifies you have to take the wounds on models within those three inches, which means if your opponent is not paying attention to how he's moving, you can bombing run and force him to take out critical bases. If they have a large tactical squad that has like four bases of missile launchers in the rear, you can fly over and make sure you're positioned in such a way that the only models he can remove are those missile launchers. Or hell, if you're fighting Auxilia, your wing bombs can target the commander and totally rope the command structure just by flying over them. It is super funny and allows you to make very good use of movement shenanigans while also just being effective, you also don't have to do this because with the Colossus Bomb, it is six attacks hitting on threes at AP minus four. It is a decimator of infantry bases and it has four more bombs as well in the wing bombs that are going and hitting on fours at AP minus two as well. You're not going to, but you can take out 10 Marine bases in one flyby with these bombers. They drop that big bomb once and then they're done, and the interesting thing is your opponent may not be incentivized to shoot them afterwards because their main payload is gone. But if they don't, you still have the wing bombs to make use of. You're still dropping four bombs every time this thing comes in, and at a relatively low investment, they're only 85 points. We are bringing two of them, one here and one later, which we'll see. But the general idea here is these things are meant to fly over thin out and just lay low whatever sort of roaming infantry that they feel is opportune and then return to base and keep doing that on scattered remains as they go by. Now to the main event and that is our armored company, the good core of any auxilia or guard equivalent if you will. 
We are taking six Lehman Russes and four Malkador tanks, uh, one of which I recommend you make your tank commander, and two of the Auxilio Super Heavy Tank Squadron units or Bane Blades, basically, if you will. Now, the general idea here is that we spent more investment into the Malkadors because not only are they tougher, and that's why you should probably give the tank commander to them, they have enough point defense systems to also be serviceable to thin out infantry that's coming towards you, as well as do it at, while they're moving. Not as efficiently as a Sakaran, but almost as efficiently, but certainly being tougher than a Sakaran. The Lehman Russes then have the range on marine vehicles, as well as a hell of a punch with Vanquisher cannons, and you can give them last cannons, or you can give them heavy bolters for more point defense if you want, the choice is yours. The Super Heavies then have the benefit of just being able to do both and be a pain to move. So overall, you have an incredibly effective armored core that is able to compete at range with enemy armor while still dealing with whatever infantry is coming up, thinning out whatever is in the way for your bombers, and the last piece of this puzzle. Now, as I've said before, uh, when it comes to sort of building out a flavorful list, I don't really count the Knights and the Titans as violating that identity because they're the cool thing you want to run. You want to run a Titan in Imperialis. You want to run some Knights. And for this, I actually think you go with Knights over Titans. We're looking for more activations, especially in our first turn. We're looking to be a little bit more mobile and up in our opponent's face if we can. A Sarastus Night Banner, I think, is just the thing to do that, that also gives this list just another punch of uniqueness along with the bombers that really makes it special. You have the Atropo upgrade, so you spend 20 points and you make your Sarastus Knight a melee-centric Sarastus Knight that has an Ion Shield, giving him 3 plus save protection. You then spend 180 points for an Armager Talent, which gives you three of the Knight Armagers, and all four of these models are relatively quick compared to the rest of your army and a pretty big threat to whatever they get close to. They have engine killer weapons and they will mess up infantry they get close to, any vehicles, they can be threats to titans. I think it's a lot of fun. It allows you to experiment and get comfortable in an easy way with the independent rule, which can be a little bit of a clunky one to use, uh, but all four of these models essentially will operate with that rule. Uh, and it lets you really focus on a flank with a surprisingly survivable unit because of the ion shield on the atropo and really surprise your opponent and take out whatever you need on that flank, focus your armor somewhere else, bombing run what you need to, and again, fly in, pick up the remains, grab the objective, hold your back line with your Velatari storm section, and remember, just continue to roll up. A lot of people get lost and constantly want to first fire their Lehman Russes. Move up. Just be aware that you need to be mobile and gaining ground. First fire is not always the best thing to do just because you have range. The thing I really like about this list is, is it the most competitive? Again, I don't think it is. Like I said, I think if you want to be the most competitive, you probably need a couple points in Marines, especially once these drop pods come out. But with the Bomber and the Knight inclusion, I think it's a unique list. I think it's an interesting list. I think it's one that's fun to use and has some exciting moments to it. And it's one that really highlights an aspect of this game that I enjoy, especially since I play a lot of Warhammer 40k, and that is that this game's not 100% about being competitive. It's about being interesting and having an interesting battle. And that's why I'm so excited for it. So I hope you try this list. I hope you tell me how it is. I hope the bombing runs are as fun as I think they're going to be. If you're having a bad dice day, uh, they're not gonna be fun at all. You're, you're gonna hate them. But if you're rolling consistently or even hot, I think you're gonna really love them, especially because they have the bunker buster rule so that can make terrain easier to deal with. And now I'll go ahead and talk about the special announcement I mentioned at the beginning of the video. As of today, I am actually a self-published author. I have published Mausoleum, a cosmic horror novella and I am incredibly excited for it and also incredibly anxious. The reason I bring it up is it was actually inspired very early on by a piece of Warhammer lore. Many years ago I heard the story about the Tyrant Star, a black dwarf star that will appear above planets signaling 
their catastrophe or impending catastrophe. While my book has nothing to do with Warhammer or war, the seedling that became Mausoleum very much began with the Tyrant Star. I already owe a lot to the Warhammer community for a lot of who I am, and this continues to be a part of that. So if you want a new cosmic horror to read, or you just want to continue to support me, as many of you already have, go ahead and check out Mausoleum. You can get it in ebook on Amazon, or you can get it in a paperback form. This is my proof copy. Yours will not have uh, that not for resale sign on it. Apparently they, they do that on uh, proof copies for some reason. I really love having this in my hands. It, it's so incredible as an author to get your first book sort of in your hands like this. Uh, the art, a lot of people have asked about it, is done by David Topachukwu. He did a phenomenal job on it. And I honestly just want to get this in the hands of as many people as possible because it was so amazing to write and it's been so encouraging seeing people's responses to it that have read advanced copies of, of it. And that's all I want is I just want people to read it and let me know what they think. So if you want to check it out, I'll link that in the description below. And if you like it, yeah, leave a comment. Let me know what you think. Leave a review. Also, let me know what y'all want for the next videos. I, again, have a lot more time to do regular releases. And next is probably going to be Blood Angels or World Eaters. I did see the Night Lords request. That one's gonna be weird. So we may get to that one after a few more things drop. We'll see, I, I may talk about it still. Anyway, again, have a good start to your 2024 and I'll see y'all next time.